I hate to make you into a, a kindergarten teacher here, but for those who have <laughs> missed the uh, previous times we've discussed it, what exactly are they? Well, they're named because they're a collective of fans who sort of pool their money together and then find ways to get it in the hands of athletes, which is legal for the first time pretty much ever uh, as of last July. Um, you know, for the first few months, a lot of that was focused on players on campus, and in a lot of places, they still are focused on uh, on places on campus. But right now, those collectives, you know, this is a major tool in recruiting. It's a big deal when people are deciding where they want to go, and the collectives, um, you know, sort of uh, do their best to make sure that players know if they come on a campus, hey, this is the kind of money that's awaiting you. So oh, now that we know what they are, uh, how are they being used, and are they sustainable? <laughs> Well, they're still figuring things out as they go. Uh, you know, the ones that are making the most impact are the ones that are the most well-funded. How well can you um, bring in donations? Um, sometimes that's diverting funds that might have other, otherwise gone to the athletic department. Sometimes that's courting major donors to say, hey, we want to give money in addition to what we give the athletic department. And then for some of these collectives, the Gator Collective at Florida, Aspire Sports at Tennessee as well, you know, they are, are courting the small-time donors. Hey, you can give $20 a month. You can give $10 a month, whether that's $100 a month, $200 a month, $1,000 a month. People that aren't going to get their names on any buildings anytime soon, but you start adding all that up, you know, 50,000 people giving 20 bucks a month. Uh, I, I should have known better than to convince myself to do math on live TV, Paul, but I think that's a million dollars. Um, and there's a lot of people, I think, a lot of programs, especially in the SEC, where getting 50,000 people to give 20 bucks a month that takes time, but it's definitely possible. And we, I bring this up because we had Jimbo Fisher on yesterday, and you know the heat he's taking. And can, do you have a I, yeah. what's that? He, he wants to pretend like it's not sort of affecting where guys are going or impacting guys' decisions. He's welcome to his opinion, um, but you talk to enough people, that is just not the case. These collectives and the NIL money that's flowing to guys that aren't even on college campuses yet. This is making very real impact on recruiting decisions. I really do think this is the most important thing in college football right now. Um, and the people that take advantage of these next two to three years when everyone's sort of building up their war chest uh, are going to be the places that have a chance to really see some upward mobility. David, based on what you've heard, what did A&M do in this most recent cycle that helped them so much that others apparently were either unaware of or unable to do? Well, I mean, you know, it's sort of hard to say because A&M doesn't have a public collective. You look at Florida, you look at Tennessee, uh, I think Georgia has theirs as well. There's a website you can go to and say, I'm a Tennessee fan, I'm a Florida fan, I'm a Georgia fan, and I can go donate here. A&M doesn't have a sort of public front-facing collective. You talk to enough people, certainly – you know, a lot of the guys that signed in that number one class are, are getting good NIL money, good NIL deals that are going to really impact their lives. Um, it was certainly something that helped, and I don't think that that's anything that's insulting to, to A&M. I, I think, you know, there have been a few times where, where Jimbo says, well, to insinuate that these guys were, uh, you know, uh, influenced at all by any of this is sort of insulting and, and all these things. I really don't think so. I, I think it's a testament to the infrastructure and the passion that's built around Texas A&M football for them to be able to mobilize so quickly and go from having a pretty good recruiting class to the number one recruiting class in the country, one of the best recruiting classes we've ever seen, eight five stars in one class, Paul. I mean, they're doing what Alabama and Georgia do and, and, and don't always do every year. That's a huge deal. And, uh, you know, to suggest that money played a role in that, I think, is, uh, again, a testament to what A&M is doing and how badly A&M wants to climb that ladder. And do you think it's a matter of, of them just being first uh, to figure it out? Because now everyone has had some time to digest uh, and, and go with these either pu public collectives or, or, or whatever. Because it, 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 it did seem like they had something figured out that nobody else really understood. Well, you know, oil money's nice. <laughs> that, that helps. Uh, you know, Texas has, I, I think Texas has four front-facing collectives, some with baseball, some that, that do uh, focus on sort of charity work, and, and you have like the, uh, you know, $50,000, you know, baseline for your, your linemen and some other positions and that kind of thing. 
Texas A&M doesn't have that public aspect. It'll be interesting to see what this evolves and what this becomes in the years to come. But, you know, ultimately it's having money, mobilizing money, and figuring that out. And exactly how that works right now is sort of unclear because it's it's not really clear how A&M is operating. You know, I've written about uh, Tennessee's collective. You know, I've talked to people at Florida and Georgia. I kind of have a good idea of how they operate. At Texas A&M, it's a much quieter operation. So exactly what happened and how is sort of hard to nail down at this moment. But I think as time goes and this becomes more and more commonplace, and and it's kind of odd right now because there's sort of a hush-hush element to all this. And I think some of that leads to a lot of casual fans. Paul, I'm not sure they understand the impact that collectives are having and the importance that these are going to have in recruiting moving forward. I think this is going to be right alongside you know, your facilities, your coaching staff, your scheme. That's something that's – really 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 important in in college recruiting and you know for some guys it's going to be the most important thing i think i mean i think anytime you make a job decision paul i make a job decision anybody compensation is a huge part of it if somebody's going to be able to offer you 40 percent more why would you not go there and i think that's a testament to wherever you're going to be able to have that infrastructure and do that so based on the reporting that you've done and and the people with whom you've spoken i know you can't just put a composite out there for us but how does this work in a recruitment either on the front end or in the portal well i've talked to some people in collectives and generally it seems like it's the first thing or the last thing that, that people tend to bring up. But it's always usually brought up because you don't want to miss your opportunity. You know, the 2022 class, the guys that committed early, this obviously wasn't legal yet. They didn't really know what was going on. Late in the 2022 class, we saw this. This was a huge impact. This had a major uh, influence on where guys went as they sort of figured out the market. But not everybody kind of knew about it. Right now, 2023, the story's out there. I mean, Paul, obviously, we wrote about the $8 million man. Um, who's getting paid $2 million a year, a five-star recruit. Um, people know that. If you're a five-star, you're probably looking for similar money. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.